good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming to listen about uh, pelvic and acetabular fractures. So I feel semi-qualified to give this talk, as luckily working at the Alpha last year, I was exposed to, to some of these. So uh, we're going to start talking about pelvic fractures, and then we'll go into talking about acetabular fractures and just go through kind of an overview, some of the anatomy. Uh, the classification of all of these fractures, I think, is important because it dictates uh, some of the management. And then we'll just go from there. So the pelvis is quite an in important uh, structure, as you can imagine. We all start our life inside a pelvis, if you think about that. And we emerge into this world through the pelvis, so it is in our best interest to continue looking after it. And it really is involved uh, these two inanimate bones and a sacrum put in a whole lot of um, very important and strong ligamentous structures in there, and you have um, the pelvis. So it's, it's a ring structure, as you can imagine, as you know, um, and that dictates some of the mechanisms of injury. Uh, so these are very strong bones, and the ligaments themselves are particularly strong. This is uh, the girdle that connects the lower limbs uh, to the rest of the body, and the, the, the entire weight of the upper body and the torso transits through the pelvis down into the feet. Um, so it requires a lot of force in the majority of these cases to break a pelvis. So in a young person, um, we're looking at motor vehicle accidents, falls from significant height. So that's always important when assessing the patient as a whole, which as orthopedic surgeons we are very good at doing. Um, we need to understand that mechanism. And like any other ring structure in the body, it always breaks at two locations. A ring doesn't break at a single location. And whether that's a bony rupture or a ligamentous rupture, we have to look at that. So certainly, uh, with these pelvic fractures, there's high incidence of other associated and life-threatening injuries, chest injuries, abdominal injuries, other long bone injuries. So very, it's very rarely do you treat a pelvic fracture in isolation um, because you have to consider the other injuries and the other physiological state that this patient is in. Obviously, the difference is going to be the old ladies who fall over and have the pubic rami fractures. Now, they are, uh, they are pelvic fractures, so they should be treated with the same severity, but um, they don't have those other associated injuries with them. Now, the mortality, ranging depending on what uh, studies or papers you look at, can go from 15 to 50 percent, 50 percent being in open pelvic fractures has a 50% mortality. Now, there was a paper published last year with some Victorian data from the Victorian Trauma Outcomes Registry, um, mainly coming out of the Alfred and the Royal Melbourne, and they reported over 350 pelvic fractures from 2000 to 2008 that were operated on, and they had a mortality of 19%. And then the risks of mortality are open fracture, like I said, 50% mortality, um, people who are hypertensive, either hypertensive at the scene, particularly if they're hypertensive when they arrive in the tertiary trauma center, um, have a much increased mortality, as well as age being over 65. So I think the thing we can take out of this is that hypertension has to be treated aggressively. <coughs> Fluid resuscitation has to start aggressively um, at retrieval of the patient, and when they arrive into the trauma bay, you need to be aggressively trying to um, resuscitate them with fluids, get blood in early, as well as try to uh, minimize any further hemorrhage. Now, with regards to um, bleeding, pelvic fractures, 80% 80 per 80 of the bleeding is actually of venous origin, so it's rarely an arterial rupture. There's um, a lot of venous blood that can be poured into the pelvis, and as the pelvis can open up, that potential space um, can open up quite dramatically, and then that you lose the tamponade effect. And that's why pelvic fractures can be quite deadly, and it can be very difficult to get on top of um, the hypovolemia associated with pelvic fractures. You can lose your entire blood volume into an open pelvis, as or an open book pelvis. So that's why it's, uh, it's very, very important to recognize that fact. So first, if we're just talking about the pelvis, um, the classific one classification is the Tal classification. Now, Marvin Tal is a, is a great man from a great country coming out of Sunnybrook uh, 
hospital in Canada, and he was one of the first. <laughs> uh, Some place just north of Toronto, <laughs> the United States of Ontario. So, uh, uh, and then he he went about, uh, and then he did a lot of work with the AO Foundation as well. And his his uh, classification system has been adopted into the AO classification. But he's looking at whether a pelvic fracture is stable, partially unstable, or unst or fully unstable. So stable fractures are when the posterior arch is intact or the entire brain is intact, such as avulsion fractures. Avulsion of, say, the ASIS or uh, the ischial tuberosity can happen. Uh, this involves, it's particularly in young people, when, when the, the bones are still uh, not fully uh, ossified. Uh, partially stable fractures um, are when the, the posterior arch is still intact. So the, Prime examples are pubic, single pubic rami fractures in, in uh, the elderly, or it's open book fractures with, with mild diastasis. Um, so these stable fractures can, can dictate your treatment. And the interesting thing about this is that you can actually remove parts of the pelvis, of the anterior pelvis, and the retina, the posterior, if the posterior arch is still intact, the pelvis will still remain stable, such as seen uh, when we do some tumor surgery and there's quite extensile excisions of, of anterior elements of the, of the pelvis. Um, the strength in the posterior arch uh, can keep the whole structure stable. And they say that the posterior ligaments and structures add to about 60% of the stiffness and stability of uh, the pelvis, where as opposed to anteriorly, it's only about uh, 40%. And then unstable, obviously, if there's a complete destruction of the rib, there's a loss of both bony and or ligamentous structures. The, the pelvis is unstable when, with the loads that go through it, um, this needs to be addressed. So here's looking at uh, the tile classification. So here we've lost the anterior structures, but the posterior arch remains intact. Um, here we've, we've broken anteriorly. We've ruptured some of the, um, the posterior structures, but the anterior um, arch is still partially intact. So that would be considered a, a partially stable fracture. Or if we ruptured both anteriorly as well as this is an SI joint um, fracture dislocation, so the entire posterior arch has been uh, disrupted, and that would be considered unstable. And then the other classification, which we're probably more, more familiar with, is the Young and Burgess classification. And that's really looking at the mechanism of the fracture. Is the force coming um, a lateral compressive force on the pelvis? Is there an anterior posterior um, compressive force? Is there some shear force? Or, as we can regularly see in motor vehicle accidents, it's going to be a combination of these. Uh oh. So, th this is a great uh, demonstration of the uh, classification. But so each, each of these grades, lateral compression, interior compression, they all go one, two, three. I hope we'll get some photos. Now with pelvic fractures, it's always important um, to get that image. And when we're ordering x-rays, especially for the medical students and the residents, we have to understand what are we doing. So when there's a pelvic ring fracture, we always look at for the a, AP fracture. Um, but we also want to have a look at um, the inlet and outlet views, because we're trying to assess uh, the pelvic ring. So here is a here is an extra uh, an example of taking an X-ray of an inlet view. So we're looking at the inlet uh, of the pelvis, um, and that is depending on which paper you read, anywhere from 35 to 45 uh, degrees uh, tilt to uh, inferiorly, uh, and then that gives you a good view of the pelvic rim, and uh, gives you an idea of uh, some anterior and posterior displacement uh, of the pelvis. All right. So, and then looking at the outlet, outlet view is is pretty much the opposite. And again, depending on which papers you read, somewhere from 35 to 45 degrees, uh, valid uh, angulation of the of the view gives us a good view of the outlet of the pelvis, and this gives us a good view of the sacrum as well as it gives us an idea of the flexion of the hemipelvis, where there's any uh, flexion or extension of the pelvis, as well as any vertical displacement. So these views are very useful in determining 
anterior posterior in the inlet views, uh, any vertical displacement of the pelvis as well as flexion. So these provide much more information than solely looking at just an AP uh, pelvic view. And again, when we get to acetabular fractures, there's going to be another series of x-rays that we use in just trying to get that concept of what are we looking at. And then that's very important with, with the x-rays we use because, uh, as you would all agree, interns and residents, uh, these are very rare, poorly understood by sometimes emergency as well as the junior staff when ordering these x-rays and require you know, these patients with severe injuries having to go back down and get more x-rays. So it's important you try to, if anything, grab inlet outlet views are important for pelvic fractures, for pelvic ring fractures versus different for the acetabular fracture. So the management uh, with, with any pelvic fracture, these are severe traumas. So they need to be uh, resuscitated aggressively according to EMST and AST guidelines. No surprises there. Um, as I said, with the hypotension being a predictor for organ mortality, we really need to address hypotension um, aggressively in the emergency department. And anyone with a pelvic fracture or a suspected pelvic fracture should come in uh, with a pelvic binder. Now, the, the worry about a pelvic binder, and you have to be aware of, is that they can create pressure areas very, very quickly. So you need to be constantly vigilant uh, about any pressure that you're putting on prior to fixation. So I know that at uh, the Royal Melbourne, they use a pelvic binder that has three straps, and they only have ever two straps done up at one time, and they continually rotate through these straps to avoid any specific pressure areas. Um, now, unfortunately, we weren't using that at Alpha, but it sounds like a great idea, and I have no experience with that. Now, once we've got some imaging, we've got an idea of, of, of what's happening, we need to immediately, in, in an urgent situation, of, of try to assess this patient, whether we can just leave them as a non-operative patient or plan for any fixation down the track, or whether these people need to have their bleeding stemmed. Um, and that can be done by a variety of different ways. Obviously, an unstable mobile pelvis <coughs> leads to more continued venous bleeding. So, uh, fixation can be considered whether that's leaving the pelvic binder on for you know 12 to 24 hour period. Uh, certainly at the Alfred, external fixation was put in in almost every single patient. Um, or you can use a C clamp, which is a, a type of external fixative. Or there's other facilities around the world. Uh, neither one in Melbourne tend to do a lot of angiographic uh, embolization, uh, trying to stem the bleeding. And then, and then we can definitively plan the fixation down the track. And then, uh, just as in any uh, broken bone, you have to decide whether you're going to operate or whether you're going to um, do a, a definitive internal fixation. Or you can always use external fixation as your definitive treatment of the fracture. And we'll just talk about that. So here's an example, a real case, of an open book pelvis that came in uh, without a pelvic binder in. The pelvic binder was placed and that closed up that potential space. And as you can imagine, closing the pelvis helps tampen out the bleeding and is quite effective. For the interns and residents, it's really important to know that where we think our hips are and we're feeling really, you know, the iliac crest, compressing there is not going to be any good. Really, you want to compress over the greater trachanas and bring those pelvis in and rotate the pelvis back in. So you can see the pelvic binder is quite low. It's not sitting around the waist. It's actually sitting around um, the hips, okay? And that's really important because that's how you're going to close the, the pelvis up. Um, it can be routinely this pelvic binder is, is placed too superiorly and does not have the effect uh, that is required. So this is an example of uh, some pa a patient who is treated in external fixation. Uh, there's a variety of different places you can use. You can put your pins. You can put them into the iliac wing. Uh, you require two on either side and put it on a spanning external fixator, or you can do super acetabular pins, um, which have probably a higher higher risk of um, iatrogenic complications, but have a much stronger uh, biomechanical purchase um, and are probably less effective. Now, it's important to know that if this patient has chest or trauma injuries and they're going to theater, especially if they need an emergency laparotomy, you have to be involved from the beginning to try to put this external fixator. You can imagine if they do a laparotomy and they start um, manipulating the internal organs and the pelvis, that that's just going to contribute to the bleeding. So you should uh, consider in, in consultation with the trauma or general surgeons putting your external fix fixator on before they go in and open up. 
the abdomen. This is um, a C clamp, which is another form of external fixation. It's very, very temporary. It's not a definitive treatment. Um, and it's used uh, for these posterior um, instability where the SI joint has been dislocated and needs to be closed down. So the, the place you're aiming for is the ASIS. If you draw a, a vertical line down there and a horizontal line in line with the femur, that's your target zone. What you're trying to do is place these clamps onto the ileum and, and compress down that um, opened SI joint and providing some stability from the pain. Now this is a, a, a loose structure, so it, the C clamp should be able to rotate back and forth. That way you avoid any pressure areas anteriorly, as well as give um, the surgeons options for laparotomy. And things. Now this is a temporary measure to try to stem um, bleeding in the emergent situation. It, it needs to be definitively treated pretty within 24, 48 hours uh, with some kind of SI screw, which we can talk about next time. So pelvic fractures, non-operative. The majority of pelvic fractures in this hospital are treated non-operatively. That's because um, every five minutes an orthopedic registrar in this facility is called about a pubic rami fracture in uh, rehab. Uh, and so these are the, the AP, or their pubic rami are, are lateral compression fractures. People fall on the side and they, they buckle. Uh, anteriorly, there's normally associated with a sacral fracture as well. Um, and these fractures are stable. The posterior ring is intact. So these people can weight bear as tolerated. Um, or if there's severe medical comorbidities, if the patient's not fit for theater, obviously we're not going to take them to theater for definitive management. Um, is, so this is an APC, um, so anterior posterior compression fracture type 2, which means that there's a diastasis of the pubic symphysis of greater than 2.5 um, centimeters, which we can see in here. And this can be sim treated uh, quite simply by placing uh, a plate, closing up the, the pubic synthesis, and plating that anteriorly. Now, there's some facilities, um, particularly the Alfred, they love to also think that there's some element of posterior instability. Um, and they're putting in these Pangea rods, similar to spinal fusion rods, and putting two screws into the ileum with a, a transiting rod just under the skin. Feeling that adds stability, but we're still waiting for data whether that's more effective or not. Um, so lateral compression fracture um, type 2, we can see the disruption here, fracture through into the SI joint. There's also going to be um, ipsilateral pubic rami fractures, you can see in here. And then that can be plate, um, plated with some SI screws and plates in the back. Stabilizing again, focus on the posterior arch being the most important. And if that's stable, sometimes you don't need to fix everything up anteriorly. So this is uh, an APC, uh, so anterior-posterior compression, open book pelvis. Um, when they get into level three, the pubic rami is sometimes disrupted. And as you can see here, there's a, there's a dissociation of the uh, SI joint here on the right. And then that's been treated with a, a sacroiliac screw, um, closing that down, getting that compressure, as well as addressing the instability anteriorly, which is quite so here's a, a lateral compression fracture. So they're, they're marked by having um, ipsilateral posterior and anterior as well as a contralateral uh, fracture patterns. And so this is just an example of sometimes the extensile amount of uh, fixation that you need to stabilize this pelvis. So now we'll move on quickly to the acetabulum. So looking at the acetabular anatomy and uh, the six important lines that we need to know uh, for assessing x-rays, and then this is going to lead into that important thing. So we've got the, the, the number one here is the iliopectinal line, and then the ilioischial line coming down here. Uh, anyone who's been in a hip replacement will always talk about the, the teardrop, which is level three. We've got the roof of the acetabulum. Uh, anteriorly here, we've got uh, more medially is the anterior um, acetabular wall and the posterior acetabular wall. And unfortunately, Mr. Tran, there's, there's no femoral antiversion there, so I think this person will avoid a hip scope, which is good. Crossover <laughs> sign, if you guys remember. 
<laughs> and then we have to look at the acetabulum also as being two columns. Um, so we have the anterior column imbuing the, the pubis and the iliac crest here and the ischium and the posterior um, posterior walls was the posterior element of the uh, the acetabulum itself. These so this is a great diagram explaining both the anterior and posterior column, which is very is referenced highly in classifying all of these type of fractures. Some people describe the acetabulum as being a cave uh, between the junction of two two bony columns. Unfortunately, oh, those didn't convert very well. So you, so acetabular fractures we can convert them into. Just simple fractures, whether they're posterior, a posterior wall fracture, uh, a posterior column fracture, anterior wall, anterior column, or whether it's a transverse fracture, a simple fracture involving both columns, um, or then they can be uh, a combined element. So where where you're involving either two columns, posterior wall, and there's multiple fragments, and they have to be addressed um, in different ways. So any acetabular fractures, they are a pelvic fracture, um, but we treat them a bit differently because they're more specific because it's a joint fracture. So again, we have to EMST, AATLS uh, protocols, and these people need appropriate um, planning. All of these, these patients should have appropriate x-rays. Now, some surgeons believe that you don't actually need a CT scan um, to determine what kind of fracture it is, and I would agree with that. Uh, but having a CT scan is very, very useful for intraoperative planning. Um, so there's different kinds of management. As in any, any fracture that we have, we can treat them non-operatively. Um, and that can either be as a definitive treatment or because it's too high risk. We can treat them in skeletal traction to offload the femoral head into the acetabulum. And that's normally for about three to four weeks. Uh, we can always treat these people in external fixation, but again, um, with the, the muscular contraction of the femur, putting pressure onto the acetabulum, sometimes external fixation uh, can be difficult and may require uh, putting it into the femur as well. Uh, operative fixation, or then the other treatment, we can always, if they're old and osteoporotic, we have the option of allowing the fracture to heal up and then treating them with a, a, to, a total hip replacement down the track. And that should be considered. Sorry that my uh, things haven't converted well. So if we're looking at non-operative management, again, this is a joint fracture, so the same joint principles as in any fracture should apply, shouldn't they? So if we're looking at one millimeter step uh, or less than two millimeter gap uh, of a fracture, then, then we can certainly consider treating these people non-operatively, and that's a good idea. If it's solely a posterior wall fracture with less than 20 to 30% of the wall, um, then that's another fracture that, we, that will heal up well and will have good results with regards to. The aim being trying to increase function, decrease pain, and decrease degenerative disease down the track. If it's a both column fracture but there's still good congruence of the, of the joint, then that is a, a candidate for non-operative management. And obviously if this patient is very, very unwell, or the other thing you need to think about is if their bone is really, really soft, trying to get fixation, watching it fall apart in front of you, screws going, penetrating into the joint. Um, so these are candidates for letting them gum up, maybe putting them in skeletal traction while the fracture heals, and then down the track at 6 to 12 weeks, putting a total hip replacement in, and they will do well out of that. So depending on what paper you read, some people uh, have no problems giving them protected or partial weight bearing early. Uh, certainly. Everyone I've ever worked with tends to be a lot more conservative and use non-weight bearing and acetabular fractures, except for uh, posterior, you know, wall fractures that aren't in the weight bearing surface. So depending on the fracture type, you can get them moving. Obviously, mobilization and getting them mobile is very, very important, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Operative management. So obviously, displaced fractures when the joint is no longer congruent, um, we need to look at trying to reduce the joint line as best as possible. Or obviously, if there's a fracture dislocation, which is very common, uh, a lot of acetabular fractures are also associated with being in the flexed uh, position with an axial load. They talk about the dashboard 
kind of injury. So you get a posterior wall, posterior <laughs> column, as the femoral head uh, is, is loaded in through the acetabulum and pops out the back. So if there's a dislocation that you cannot uh, reduce closed in emergency or theater, then that's a sign for going in there and fixing it uh, in, that, in the initial approach. So depending on what kind of fracture it is, you also need to consider the approach. Now, I could spend a whole uh, three hours talking about the approach, so I'll, I'll just go over these briefly. Uh, the Cocker-Langenbach uh, approach is, is um, a modified version of the all similar to the posterior approach that we use for the hip, but it's obviously more extensile. So this can be mainly done in the lateral position, but it also can be done in the prone position, in which uh, you make the incision uh, around the iliac crest and coming down to 10 centimeters below uh, the greater trochanter. Sort of and posterior approach is going to be good for posterior column fractures, posterior wall fractures. We're going to get a good view of that and have good access. The ilioinguinal approach is an anterior approach, and that goes from about five centimeters above the ASIS, coming all the way down to just above uh, the pubic symphysis. And then this, the ilioinguinal uh, gives us access to the pubic rami, to the anterior column, as well as to the inner table and to the SI joint. So it's quite, an, it's quite a big incision and it goes through th different windows, we have to be wary about a variety of different structures. So um, the medial window is going, is going medial to all of the, the iliac vessels. Between the iliac vessels and the psoas, you can open up a plane in there, and that goes your middle window. And then lateral uh, to the spermatic cord, uh, you can get the lateral window. And that's gonna, what's going to get you all the way up to the inner table and down to the SI joint. So things that we need to be worried about this, obviously the iliac uh, vessels before they turn into the femoral vessels. The femoral nerve is at risk. The lateral femoral cutaneous nerve uh, is almost always uh, has to be sacrificed, which leads to numbness on the lateral side of the thigh, just because that's right in the field and we can't get access otherwise. The other thing that you need to be worried about is the corona mortis, which is uh, an anastomosis of the obturator artery, uh, as well as some of the deep or uh, the deep epigastric vessels or the uh, internal uh, iliac vessel. Now this uh, arterial anastomosis is very deadly because if you sever it, um, it's got two arterial edges and they can retract and the bleeding can be quite pronounced. Now there's some studies that say this is found in everyone, um, but depending on the size, but certainly around 30% of people will have uh, a significant corona mortis that needs to be to be wary of, and that sits on mainly around the level of the pubic rami, the superior pubic rami. Uh, and then uh, the stopper approach is another one that's going through a, a fan and steel incision, and that gives us access to uh, the pubic symphysis, as well as you can get into the anterior column a little bit, and then you can use a lateral window, so you're using one fan and steel incision here, as well as a lateral window over the iliac crest, as opposed to um, the ilioinguinal, so it's either kind of one or the other. And then there's one incision which I didn't write about here, which is the extensile excision. Um, and this is used for both column fractures, and that's in the prone position. And that's uh, cutting along the line of the iliac crest, and then coming down to the greater trochanter and coming down the femur. So an extended iliofemoral uh, incision. And, and that gives us the most extensile exposure to both columns, um, but is, is quite significant. So here's an example of a, a, a posterior wall fracture that's been plated uh, posteriorly. Unfortunately, my, my views, I, I missed this. We need to get Jude views, which is, is what, um, what one of my other slides has shown. So for the interns and residents, so what you do is, if you, if you rotate someone to 45 degrees um, with the affected side up, that's called the, the obturator oblique view, so 45 degrees, and that's going to give you a good view of the uh, anterior column and the posterior wall. And then if you flip them onto the other side, um, you're going to get an iliac uh, column, ileal oblique view. Um, and that's going to give you a good view of the posterior wall, posterior column and the anterior wall. So that's, you're basically flipping them 45 degrees one way and 45 degrees the other way. And you think, if 
because it's, it's quite symmetrical. So if you're taking Jude views on one side of the pelvis, the one side of the pelvis, you're looking at the anterior wall and the posterior column. But on the other acetabulum, you're looking at, at the reverse. So whenever you take Jude views, um, Jude views on one side of the pelvis is looking at the opposite Jude views on the other acetabulum. So that's important to know. When we're looking at acetabulum, we're trying to isolate, um, you know, the, here's a good view of the, the, the anterior column here. But these are, these are more AP views. But if you rotate them around, you could see. So I'm sorry that this hasn't predicted well to explain. You can imagine if you're taking an x-ray here at 45 degrees, you're going to get a good view of the anterior wall and the posterior column. Does that make sense? Right. But when you're looking here on this side, you're looking at the anterior column and the posterior wall. All right. So when you so residents really important Jude views acetabular fractures inlet outlet views um, for pelvic ring fractures so that's the main difference. here's an example of, of a posterior this is a posterior column fracture um, so we've had to go through a Cocker Langen back approach sometimes you need to, to get access you need to make this trochanteric osteotomy to get good access and the interesting thing here is you can see this heterotopic ossification which is also a significant risk with these kind of fractures. So this is a great picture, um, an, an example of one of the complications that we can see. So this is an anterior wall fracture. And again, it shows that there's an associated femoral shaft fracture. These are high trauma uh, kind of patients and have lots of association. You can see that there's a bit, been a very good reduction here of the joint surface, which is, is most important. So reduction is the most important thing with pelvic acetabular fractures. Reduction, 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 just as in any joint. And so here's an example of a, of a transverse and a posterior wall. So this is a combined mechanism. And again, going through a cocker langen back uh, approach, you can see quite extensile amount of plating, just to give you a bit of a feel. So going into the pitfalls and complications, that these are the things that whenever these people come in, we need to be worried about. Obviously, these people are at high risk for infection. They have a lot of, of hemorrhage, a lot of blood. They're given blood transfusion. Um, some, so they say lateral compression fractures, the average patient will get four and a half units of blood. If it's an AP uh, compression fracture, that goes, goes up to about 13 units of blood when the pelvis really opens up. So we also know that blood transfusion is associated with infection. Open fractures is associated with infection. These extensile um, and very large incisions and large operating times are all associated with infection. Nerve injury, whether that's associated with the direct injury, uh, especially acetabular fractures, sciatic nerve is particularly at risk. Whether it's pelvic fractures, the lumbosacral plexus is, is regularly injured, or whether that's going through our approach, lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. Nerve injury is, is very common and needs to be worried, uh, needs to be concerning. Deep vein thrombosis is a very, very significant risk for any pelvic fractures. Um, and can be a, a contraindication to surgery. So if someone has a known DVT or a known clot, you need to think about putting in um, vena cava filters prior to surgery because these people are going to embolize intraoperatively. Non-union and avascular necrosis are significant risks, um, especially in acetabular fractures. Posterior wall, posterior column fractures tend to have uh, the most common complications of avascular necrosis. Or, or open fractures. Um, so as you can imagine, if your pelvis itself goes into avascular necrosis, this can be quite problematic. Uh, Post-traumatic osteoarthritis, uh, with regards to, in particular, acetabular fractures, is, is very concerning. And heterotopic uh, ossification, as we discussed already. So going into acetabular fractures, it's not a bad idea to put them on HO prophylaxis. And the standard would be indomethacin. Some people use the other anti-inflammatory. So I think in summary, this is that uh, pelvic and acetabular fractures are potentially life-threatening injury. We need to be very aggressive at treat, resuscitating them uh, with their fluid resuscitation. Um, they're very well classified, um, and things haven't really changed in the last 15 years looking through JOS, certainly that is the case. Uh, interesting enough is, is that there's different treatment protocols even in Melbourne. Um, if you, if you break your pelvis on the north side of the Yarra River, you're probably going to go sit in a pelvic binder 
a little while and then get an operation. If you go into the, the Alfred, you will be rushed up to theater and have an external fixator put on. Certainly, there, there's no difference in the mortality from the paper published last year between 2000 and 2008. Depending on which place you go to, there's no difference in the mortality. And now, we're, there's a new paper, uh, the pelvic fellow from the Alfred was looking at the classifications and the treatment of the different classifications, whether their outcomes were any different. And it probably, again, looks like there's no difference. Uh, so the one question is, should we be going to angio to, to stem off the bleeding? That is another uh, very debatable topic, but there's no strong evidence to show that that in any way affects mortality. So my belief is always, as a minimalist, do the least amount of harm you can to the patient. Um, and then Jude views, guys for acetabular fractures and inlet outlet views. That's directed straight at the resident. Okay, so thank you.